Man, on this Flame Tech Football Friday, we've covered a lot. I'm thrilled. This is going to be awesome. Chris Getzlaff was a Hall of Famer long before he was even named a Hall of Famer last week by the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. He joins us in the bunker. How are you doing, Chris? Excellent. How Good. are you doing? I'm doing great now that you're here. I was handling this on my own for a while because the moose is gone. He's gone to the lake, so it's nice to have somebody else in here to talk sports with. How's the summer been? Can't complain. I mean, had pretty some pretty phenomenal weather. All this yes. rain probably could have happened in June to help out the farmers, I bet. But, I mean, uh, I've been working really hard. This summer has been a lot more uh, work with my business than, than normal summers. Um, other than that, you know, I've got a few things down around the house and played a few rounds of golf. Good for you. Well, Chris is uh, in the financial planning game and not like he needs any. Pull your mic up a little closer there, Gets, if you don't mind. Not like he needs any introduction, but uh, Ty Cats, Eskimos, Rough Riders alum and a member of the famed Gets Laugh sports family. And so we gotta, we'll take your questions, of course. That's what makes this fun. Not like I couldn't fill the whole time for Chris myself. But let's start with the current environment of the CFL. Your former team, the Elks, has game postponed this week because of a COVID outbreak. Have you sat back and said, I'm so glad I'm retired? Has that hit you <laughs> yet? Uh, or have you thought, are you, do you, has that hit you at all? Uh, I mean, still miss the game on a regular basis. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you can only play for so long. It's not like a, a regular career yeah. that you can, you know, kind of work as, uh, as long as you want to. So... Um, I miss the game. I'd love to be able to play it still, but uh, do I regret retiring or where I'm at or anything like that? Absolutely not. And, you know, the, the, the current situation and the environment uh, right now, I, you know, I'm glad I'm not a part of that. Well, that's kind of what I meant. I knew that you would miss the game, but these protocols and so forth are, they seem a little tedious. And I know that you won a great cup with Brendan Labatt and you know what Big Blue's take was on that. He's like, I'm not interested in participating in this. I'm trying to find the comment from Mandy at Edmonton, guys. She's got like, here she goes. She, goes, she says, I'm watching on YouTube on my big screen TV and Facebook on my phone at the moment. Pretty slick different experience when it's on TV. So thank you, Mandy. I appreciate you watching in Edmonton. And I guess that's my point. I mean, if you, if you put COVID aside, the games have been pretty good. You've been watching? Oh, yeah. What do yeah. you think of the quality of play and what we've seen through three weeks? I think that there's been a real... Uh, it's been a good product on the field. Um, I think that the lack of preseason and uh, normal training camp, I think, has definitely hindered the offenses to start the, the season. I mean, I, th I think that most offenses have come out pretty slow. Defense have been dominating games a lot more than you would traditionally see in the CFL anyway. So, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, I've been very entertained. You know, there's been tight games, uh, turnovers, uh, you name it. Uh, there's been more defensive battles than I would say anything, though. Mm -hmm. uh, very difficult to predict outcomes. I don't know if you do that or not, but I was like one of four last week, which is actually a great thing. Um, our viewers, I said that we would take some questions from them and let's do that. That's, uh, again, the secret sauce of this show. Uh, somebody asked, who's faster, you or Ryan? And I got to say this about your family because I've known you guys a long time. You've never, ever got tired of questions about your brother Ryan Getzlaff, star of the Anaheim Ducks, which is cool. Have you gotten tired yet of those questions? Who's faster? Who's a better skater? Who's this? Who's that? No, I never will. I think they're interesting questions, and it just goes to family dynamics and, you know, how I, I feel and how I grew up with, with Ryan. You know, I'm always going to be open to those questions, so they never bother me. Um, I'm beyond proud for the success that he's had um, in all aspects of life, but obviously specifically in the hockey world is, is um, pretty amazing. So, no, obviously I'm faster. <laughs> Well, and I would think he would win a skating race. However, you're just that much younger than me that we never had an opportunity to play on the Rough Riders hockey team together. But there are local hockey people that say that you can dangle yourself. What is your hockey resume? When, and when did you make the decision to specialize football uh, over hockey? Okay, yeah. I, well, I've never stopped playing hockey. So, um, But I, I was playing very competitive hockey. Uh, I played for Team Sask when I was 12 years old. Um, back to back years, Adam hockey, I played for team Saskatchewan both years. So, you know, I was, you know, one of the better players in the province at that time, um, uh, going into Wee, that's when contact hockey started back then, uh, 
I was very small and I got cut from tier one hockey after playing for team Sask the year before I got cut from tier one hockey because they said I was too small. So, um, uh, I still ended, I still continued to play and, uh, I truly made a decision, um, in, uh, between grade 11 and grade 12, uh, I was trying out for the pack Canadians and I had two, two good days where I thought that I was likely to make the team and, um, I decided to focus on football because I wanted to be a, a captain on the team. And I thought that uh, trying to do both wouldn't allow me um, that opportunity. So no coach made you pick? Or uh, no, no coach made me pick or anything. I would say there's definitely pressure on both sides to kind of pick. But it's not like anyone was sitting there saying, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. It wasn't anything like that. But I think that there is pressure because it's obviously a big commitment on both sides. Football, you're practicing every day. Pack Canadians are going to be practicing slash playing all the time. So, you know, there, there's a lot of pressure to uh, be able to handle both. Mm -hmm. Well, that's been going on for decades and decades and decades that I've known of players that have been forced into a decision. So uh, it's good that you were able to make that decision yourself. Really? Right. And, and by the way, announced going into the Rough Riders Hall of Fame last week. I mean, I texted you that day. I'll say it again. Congratulations. How does that feel? Thank you. Uh, surreal feeling. I mean, uh, um, you know, you, you hope that one day that you had made an impact in order to, to get recognized in that manner. And, you know, getting that call was, uh, was really exciting. And, and hearing that I'm going in with uh, Andy is, is also very exciting. It's good to be a great weekend sharing it with him. We have some hockey and NHL questions coming in, which I know you don't shy away from. But I will say this. A, uh, somebody that wasn't really in the know wrote me when your announcement came down, and they said, is, is, has he had a Hall of Fame career? And I'm like, yeah, 1,000-yard credentials, top Canadian in the Grey Cup, just like your boy Fantuz is going in with you. You have very similar football resumes, which is kind of cool. And can you speak of your relationship with Andy Fantuz, if you don't mind? I have a great relationship with Andy. I mean, um, he's a great person, phenomenal player, he, great competitor, amazing hands, was able to find space somewhat like no other. Um, you know, so, so getting to know him while we were playing the game and uh, having the success that we were having while playing together, you know, obviously developed into a friendship that, that still lasts today. So I have a great relationship with him. Um, it's not like we're talking every week by any stretch, but... You know, we're, we're catching up every few months at a minimum. And like I said, it's going to be a phenomenal weekend to be able to share that experience with them. Before we do switch to hockey, what is your take for the CFL fans and the Rough Riders fans that are watching this 3-0 and team about these Saskatchewan receivers? Braden Lenius, Mitchell Picton, and the other Canadians. It's pretty special to watch. Yeah, I think it's pretty exciting. I think they have a great core. And I mean, you you could probably go and list off five of them that, that can go out there and play right now. But, you know, the guys that uh, are getting their time, they're definitely making an impact. And, and you can tell they're, they're doing things right and they're, they're making the plays that they're supposed to. So it's pretty exciting to watch, and uh, I'm loving it. From Mike Blackbird, he's watching in Toronto. He is an Argonauts fan, but he said, does size really need to matter in sports? And I would say to that, does Dolly Parton sleep on her back? Your brother, like I've seen him play, we all have, but to see him play live is another story. And I remember sitting in the stands in the Honda Center. I think it was at practice. You were there. Rich Preston was with us, and Rich goes, uh, Rico goes, Ryan just kind of does whatever he wants out there. Like, he is a moose. Yeah, okay? he's, he's a big human being. and. <laughs> Size definitely plays a part. I mean, in today's hockey world, you know, it's it's not as big as a deal as it once was because of the how the rules change and everything, the clutching and grabbing that kind of got taken away, um, which is adding more penalties, obviously. Um, so, you know, being a, a smaller, quick skater um, now means more than it used to. So, but, I mean, you know, if you're bigger, stronger, faster, obviously that's going to play a part in success. Your brother could have thrived in any era, right? Like he's made a great career in this era, but he kind of what is cut from the cloth of the old era. But by the way, I almost texted you, but didn't want to bother you in NHL free agency this summer. You get, <laughs> you get it. Because 
I saw your brother linked to the Montreal Canadiens and the Edmonton Oilers, and I thought. But then a very close friend of your family said, "There's no way he's ever leaving. He loves it there. The Ducks were going to look after him, and they did, obviously. But was did you ever think there was a chance he would sign somewhere else? I did actually. Really, think there was going to be a chance. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I never thought it prior to you know free agency kind of approaching, but the fact that he was actually going to free agency. Um, meant that he, you know, he was willing to hear what other teams had to say and uh, for the first time in his career have a chance to be touted. You know, uh, he'd always re-signed with Anaheim before ever having an opportunity to hear from anybody else. So the, the fact that he reached that and, and I was actually um, listening to, to what other teams had to say and, and trying to get him to potentially sign with them, uh, I thought that there was a chance. Uh, I figured as long as Anaheim was willing to offer him a contract, he would likely stay because, you know, it's a pretty long, successful career he's had there. And um, I'm sure that he would prefer to close the book um, playing for only one team in his career. So, but there was a chance. I get it, though. And it's nice to be courted, right? Those teams wanted him, I'm sure, right? Because oh, yeah. he's still got a lot of gas left in the tank, but what do you see ahead for the Anaheim Ducks? Because, by the way, I haven't picked third in the Pacific Division and got lambasted for that. <laughs> I got Vegas, Edmonton, Anaheim. Am I getting ahead of myself? Uh, I don't know. You know, I think that they could be a team that, that has uh, surprises some people this year. Um, whether they'll be extremely competitive, I don't know about that. But, you know, playoffs... I think they'll be on the edge. Yeah. Yeah. From Jeff Kabilis in Winnipeg, he says, as a Bomber fan, I absolutely loved that group of all Canadian receivers you were a part of. Congrats on the induction, Chris. That's nice when fans of the other teams uh, chime in with that. Arlene in Saskatoon says, congratulations on your call to the Plaza. Well-deserved. What's your opinion about the Canadian ratio in the CFL? I know you have strong thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that it's, uh, a part of, of the Canadian game. And I think that it should continue to be part of the Canadian game. Um, you know, it allows players an opportunity to to get out and show what they can do. And, you know, if it wasn't for the Canadian ratio, I, I think that there's several players um, that wouldn't have got their opportunity. And, you know, I could be one of those. I'm not, not 100% on that, but I definitely think that there's a chance if the ratio didn't exist that I may have not got the same looks that I did or the same opportunities that I ended up getting um, in order to, you know, make my mark in, in the game. Troy in Toronto from Sober Athletic Wear says, which quarterback did you mesh with the best during your career and what made you and the quarterback click? Uh, Darian Durant by far. Um, that's a lot of practice. You know, you you go out every day and you're, you're throwing with with the quarterback and and if you get to spend a lot of time with the one quarterback you get to know each other's tendencies very well and when you're when you're both on the same page and be able being able to see what the defense is doing uh, it just makes things click and and you're able to make plays um, you know doubles and I had a, a very good um, understanding of when defenses were uh, bringing zero coverage blitzes and you know, he really trusted me in those situations to recognize it and, and break off my route accordingly. And, uh, you know, we made a lot of plays in those situations. Uh, I'm thinking about the uh, your breakout game in Calgary, that big, deep touchdown. What do you remember about that game? What year was that? Oh, Everything. <laughs> yeah, talk about that game, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was 2009. Uh, I think it was week five. Uh, it was my first opportunity to uh, be a top four starter as a receiver you know i had got some time as the fifth receiver into the end of 2008 and and prior to uh, week five in 2009 but andy was hurt uh, that week so i got the chance to go in um i i scored an, an early touchdown in the game and um really the the part of that game that's specifically stands out is you know we're a minute and a half left in the game we're third and ten uh we're down by six and um i Durant hits me on an adjustment like I was just talking about, uh, hits me on a deep ball, and I score a 60-yard touchdown, and we end up winning the game by one. So, uh, yeah, that game stands out in my head a lot. Yes, but it was shortly after that, and we're going to break here right away, but I remember I was 
bragging you up, obviously, and your speed. Do you remember pulling me aside and you're like, maybe don't talk about my speed? Because <laughs> these DBs don't know. You're going to the Hall of Fame, Chris. When did, you, when did the DBs, you stop sneaking up on them and you get respect for your speed? Um, well, I don't know if the speed was ever really respected. And I think that there's, there's some warrant behind that. You know, I've, I was never the fastest guy. My top end was definitely decent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but if, if I was going from a standstill, it's not like my, my takeoff was anything special. But, um, you know, when you get an advantage of a waggle, which I played for the most of my career as a slot back, um, you get that advantage where, you know, I can take uh, full shots at the line of scrimmage um, and hit full speed going into everything that I want to do. You know, that, that changes the game significantly. Hall of Famer Chris Getzlaff with us here in the bunker on a Flame Tech Football Friday. Ticats Riders, Eskimos alum, member of the famous Getzlaff sports family. NFL, you go into the uh, fantasy stuff in that? Oh, absolutely. You do, huh? Oh, yeah. So what are you thinking about with this season? We're heading into the last weekend of the NFL preseason, then a week off, and then it's 2021 kickoff time. What are you going to be watching? I, wa I mean, I, wa I watch all football. Yeah, I watch all football, whether it's CFL or NFL. So, um, yeah, and I watch a lot of it. It was It's the one sport that I watch more than anything that I'm very dedicated um, to watching. Um, so, um, you know, I have multiple fantasy drafts that are coming up here yet for, for Multiple, NFL. huh? Yeah, I'm in a few. I'm in a few different leagues. So uh, I think it adds a great aspect to the game. You know, it's it's that much more fun watching a game when you say when you have a player that you know their production in that game could mean something in uh, a totally unrelated area, right? Mm -hmm. You know, playing fantasy football. Did we get the right four teams, the top four teams here for Super Bowl favorites? I'll say them again: Kansas City, Tampa Bay, Buffalo, Green Bay. Yeah, that's. I would say that's probably going to be looking at the top four. I don't know if there's going to be too many other real surprises when it comes to powerhouse teams during the season. Um, I would say Kansas City probably is my favorite as well mm -hmm. at this point to win. Not my favorite team, but who is favorite your favorite team? New Orleans Saints. Really? Okay. Yeah. So Tory Gurley was on here yesterday and said this is going to be an eye opener for the New Orleans Saints in the post-Drew Brees era. They just named Jameis Winston as their starting quarterback. Is it all downhill from here, Chris? No, heck no. <laughs> They're going to be good. Saints are going to be good. Winston's going to be good. Um, he got a chance to come in and learn a little bit from Brees. You know, Peyton's amazing. Uh, it's going to be, you're going to see a different Jameis Winston. I mean, he could always sling it. And, you know, everyone always knocked him for, for his interceptions, obviously. But, you know... In his defense, he played a lot of those games from behind. Quarterbacks got to make decisions and take more chances when you're playing on when you're playing from behind. The Saints, on the other hand, you know they have they still have a very good defense, and I think that they have the the offensive weapons in order to to get it done. I think Winston will have a good year, and the Saints will be good. You see, what's so fun about this show gets is uh, just sitting here, shooting the breeze, having coffee, or in your case, water. Because people are chiming in with their, uh, with their thoughts and their comments. Because I'm sitting here going, Jameis Winston couldn't make it happen in Tampa Bay. They replaced him with Tom Brady and boop, Super Bowl. Wow, that was easy. It wasn't yeah. quite that easy, <laughs> but you could see how somebody would think that. Right. Yeah, I mean, let's not forget that they had how, how many other free agent signings that all went there. You know, partially, probably, yeah. because Tom went there. And, yeah, I mean, you're talking the greatest quarterback of all time. So, you know, was it, it an helps. upgrade at that time? Yeah, it was an upgrade. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring in the viewers because that's always so much fun that Mike Blackbird in Toronto screams, the Browns, and forever more, even though Chris Jones is no longer with the Browns, I got to get your take on Chris Jones. And I think we've told this story on this show before, but I'm going to ask you to tell it again. Your time with the Rough Riders, when they brought you back, in 2017, you enjoyed playing for Chris Jones. I did. Yeah. When I, when I came back, um, you know, obviously off the start when he first came in, kind of cleaned house and everything, um, you know, it, I would say that he, he did several things that I would consider offside. Um, 
But, you know, I, I had a, a man-to-man discussion with him when I came back and basically said, you know, I think I can help this team. It doesn't matter if I'm on the practice roster or whatever. I, I left Edmonton with the intention that, that I could help this team down the stretch. Uh, and that, that man-to-man, I think that uh, he totally respected that, and I respected the fact that he, he listened to me and brought me in. Um, so I, I did enjoy playing for him uh, once I was on the team again, and uh, I think that he he is a good coach. You know, I think there's definitely things that he could have done better, um, or maybe a little more sensitive in certain situations for sure. But you know, is he a good coach? Yeah, I think he's a good football coach. Well, as they say, there's no good way to fire somebody, <laughs> so he has his way of doing it, right? And I'm looking at your. Wikipedia, because forgive me, Gets, I'm getting old. Um, it was 2016 when you started in Edmonton. And apologies to those that aren't fans of these two teams, Edmonton and Saskatchewan. But you remember that game, first preseason game up there. They threw like Edmonton, I'm saying they, threw three straight passes to you, I think, into the end zone. Preseason game. And you capped off that opening drive for the Eskimos with a touchdown. And I remember after the game, because you'd been cut by Jones and the Riders, I was standing with a buddy of mine from the Eskimos in the stands. And I said, that little drive with Getzlaff, was that to shove it up our <clears throat> throat? He goes, yep. <laughs> that was Mike Rally to you the whole drive. You remember that? Yeah, Was I that do. called? Yeah. Can you take, uh, we've never talked about this. Uh, you know what? I don't know if they were intentionally doing it, but it's kind of how it, li- how it <laughs> played out during that drive. And, you know, thankfully I was able to cap it off. How did it feel? I mean, it was only preseason, but it still had to feel good. Yeah, it definitely feel, felt good. It, it always feels amazing. There's, there's not quite another feeling like scoring a touchdown. Uh, the adrenaline rush that goes through you, you know, you cap off whatever drive it was, but, uh, you know, you have a, at least a moment to soak it in, whereas every other play is like, yeah, you can be excited, but you got another play to get ready for, so... You know, that's pretty quick, whereas you score a touchdown, you got a little more time to soak it in. Um, you know, it being preseason and being year 10, I think, for me at that time, you know, it definitely wasn't outstanding or, you know, right, right, a, right. a real excitement situation, but I was happy to score. It's not like Claremont in double overtime of the West semifinal. Right, <laughs> right. It's so, never going to compare to that. Right. That, I mean, I, I don't. I might have even been more excited than JC was at, during that play. Like I went and just tackled him in the end zone, jumped at him right away. That was amazing against your old team, his old team. Right, right. And I remember watching Wally watch that play unfold. I can't imagine how it felt for. I'm, I get what you're saying, um, but by the way, for our Edmonton viewers, of which we have a ton. Would you, would you mind talking about your time in Edmonton? Because uh, I've talked more with your wife about it. You guys loved the city of champions as a city yeah. and, and a franchise. Yeah, we, we enjoyed our time there. Um, you know, you play for a team for so long that you don't know what it's going to be like when you leave. And, you know, for me, I felt like I walked into just another locker and... Now you're just playing with new buddies. You know, uh, I, I, re- I really enjoyed my time there. Um, my wife and I enjoyed living there as well. Um, it was just, uh, you know, kind of business as usual. It was, it was a little weird, obviously, you know, new building, new teammates, <laughs> where do I park? new coaches. <laughs> yeah, where do I park? All yeah. that stuff, getting all that sorted out. But uh, at the end of the day, it was still football. It was still meetings. And it was still, you know hanging out with uh, guys in the locker room and, and outside of uh, football. So, you know, I, I enjoyed my time there. Who were the guys that welcomed you in and first and most? Uh, I mean, Michael Riley. <laughs> I guess he wants to go by now, right? But, uh, you know, he was definitely, um, you know, one of the guys that uh, reached out to me right away. But, I, you know, so many. It, it's not even... You know, I already knew AD, I already knew Odell, uh, Sean White, you know, I had plenty of people that I had already come across at one, one time or another in my career. And really, it just felt like you're, you're walking into a situation where everyone's just happy to be there and everyone wants to get along and you're, you're fighting for a common goal. So pretty easy to get along with everyone when, 
when there's that kind of mentality going on. Yeah, you know, in the time we have left, just before I let you go, you are extolling the virtues of what makes the Canadian Football League great. But every league's great. You played junior football, you played university football, right? It's all that atmosphere. But with this COVID and what's with the CFL, how fearful were you that it was going down? I still can't quite figure out how they're playing, to be honest with you, from a financial aspect. What, what, what's your thoughts been for the last year and a half for the league that gave you so much? Uh, it's just tough. Um, you know, the CFL has never been in a position like a lot of your other major sports have where, you know, they, they have the financial backing to be able to, uh, go through whatever they need to in order to hold that season. You know, the NHL putting on a bubble, uh, the NFL having their, you know, stringent testing, on a daily basis, you know, that there's a lot of dollars that have to go into that. And, you know, if you're, if you have a league that doesn't have that kind of money, it's makes it a lot more difficult to be able to pull that season off. Right. And that's why it didn't work out last year, I think for the CFL. Um, hopefully, you know, everything that's going on, you know, can get subsided. Mm -hmm. And this is really short term, especially this past week. And hopefully they can move forward because I think that there's been a good product on the field thus far. And, You'd hate to see for it to, to go away. Well, there are some questions that came in last hour, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. I, I didn't know the answers to them, but I just wonder how closely you're following this elk situation because now the Labor Day Classic in Alberta is in jeopardy, right? How long is it going to take for them to isolate, which they're currently in isolation? And um, I said if the elk season's in jeopardy, that would, I would think mean the whole CFL season's in jeopardy because it's a small league. Where can they get these games in? You know? Well, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I don't know. How do you how do you get the games in? Uh, is there three bye weeks this year? No. No? God, I think there's one, isn't there, guy? Oh, I guess shortened season. Obviously. Right, right, yes. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I, that's the point. Yeah, it gets tough. And when when that one bye week is, is probably, well, it's either going to be one team or three teams. I don't even know. But mm -hmm. during that one week, it's it's pretty hard to reschedule it even for that week because... Both teams likely aren't on the same bye week. No, but how seriously, they're not going to do it in a bye week. So how seriously do you think leagues, not just the CFL, take player safety? For instance, as a pro football player, if you had to play two games in seven days, would you do it? Yeah, I think you'd do it. I mean, well, they've they've done that pre -COVID. Yes, they have. You know, okay, maybe had... three games in seven days then. Would you do that? <laughs> That, I mean, that's, that's taking it pretty far once you're talking three games in seven days. Uh, you know, that's, football is, one of the, is a game that is very, very hard on the body, and you need that, that week to recover. And, you know, having one Thursday game and then going to a Saturday, vice versa, you know, when you only have five days, you know, that's already kind of, kind of pushing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's doable, obviously. It's been done for a long time. But, you know, anything more than that, you know, you, you start getting to, to risk of injury, I believe. Hey, I guess the uh, obligatory question before I let you go is, assuming there will be a Grey Cup and there's no reason to think that it won't be December 12th in Hamilton, who do you think, as we sit here right now, will be in it? Who's your favorites from the West and the East? I like the Riders. <laughs> That's, I mean, they look great, and I liked them before the season. Um, and I think I will still say Hamilton, even though they're off to the, the start that they are. Um, I, I still think Hamilton's going to pull it together. You know, they've had some injury situations and like I said, offenses across the league have really struggled off the get go. So the stronger defenses have really taken over games. Um, so I'm still going to stick with them. I think, I mean, Toronto has been fairly surprising, I think early, uh, I, I thought that they would be a stronger team near the back end when they developed a lot more chemistry with all the new faces. <clears throat> but, you know, they've, they've showed pretty good. So, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Fun to watch. Big, big game tonight. Hamilton at Montreal, by the way, to kick off week four. Chris Getzlaff, congrats again on the Hall of Fame uh, nod and uh, appreciate the time. Good seeing you. Thanks a lot for having me. Hey, everybody, thanks for watching the RP Show on YouTube. And don't forget, we're live daily on YouTube from noon to 2 Eastern. If you like what you see, hit subscribe. And if you like the program, check around for other segments of The Rod Peterson Show here on YouTube.